this place. Today, as we uh, prepare ourselves to move quickly through the word, and I'm developing my habits for our power, <laughs> I would that you journey with me into what is arguably one of the most beloved instances in the life of Jesus. Certainly so in the Gospel of John, where we find it is exclusively and uniquely recorded to us. And as you turn to the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John, you may be surprised that one of the most beloved passages of Jesus is not a recorded instance of a miracle that is performed. There's some great things that happen in the Gospel of John. 5,000 are fed, Jesus walks on water, waters turn to wine, Lazarus is raised from the dead. But I would argue to you that the most beloved occurrence in the life of Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, as we read in the eighth chapter, is not about a miracle performed, but rather about mercy that is presented. Yeah. If you would stand with me as together we read from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John, a passage that is well known to just about all of us who've spent any amount of time in church. John chapter 8, beginning in verse number 2 in the New King James Version, reads as follows. Now early in the morning, he, meaning Jesus, came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Well. Because sometimes you've got to ignore foolishness. Oh, that's not in your Bible. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Yeah. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Do me a favor. I need you to pray, play preacher for a minute. Look at your neighbor and give him today's sermon title. Tell him, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh neighbor. Put, that down. put that down. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Put that down. By this time, when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, his popularity is on the rise. The Bible teaches us that he enters the temple and almost all of Jerusalem gathers together because by this point in the eighth chapter of the life of Jesus, according to the Gospel writer of John, some great things have already happened. The word is out that this Jesus has turned water into wine. It only gets better from there. Centurion has spread word that Jesus has healed his son, even though the centurion was not a Jew. Word has spread that there was a man who was sick by the pool of Bethesda for 30 and 8 years, and at the word of Jesus, he was made whole. 5,000 folk are witnesses to the power of Jesus as he was able to take some sardines and biscuits and bless everybody with leftovers. And there's even a rumor out that this Jesus walks on water. So it's no curiosity but that by the time he gets to Jerusalem and enters the temple that a crowd is gathered together. Overflow is filled. Folk are watching online. 
Everybody's gathered together to hear and to see this man who's done great things. Just about everybody believes that he is who he says he is, except for a small group who continues to reject his claim to be the Messiah. You know them. They are the Pharisees and their conservative Tea Party affiliates named the scribes. These Pharisees and conservative Tea Party affiliates named the scribes have issue with Jesus because it seems at every turn Jesus has openly questioned and criticized them. He's humiliated them in the crowds. He has poked holes in their systematic theology. He has unveiled the hypocrisy of their religiosity. And these Pharisees and scribes have issue with Jesus because He's always made them seem silly in the eyes of the people. But not today. Today is the day the Pharisees and scribes will finally get back at Jesus. They know Jesus is in the temple and Delton, they have come up with what they believe is the perfect plan to turn the tables. Jesus has questioned us, but today we're going to get him. So while Jesus is in the temple teaching, these Pharisees and their conservative Tea Party affiliates named the scribes have gone out into town and found a woman in the midst of an adulterous act. They barge in to a bedroom of adults committing adultery and they snatch the sister out the bed. Don't know what happened to the brother if he ran or if he got a pass. But they were after her. Don't be so holy that you miss how this goes down. She does not have time to put her makeup on. She doesn't have time to fix her hair she doesn't even have time to put her clothes back on. They snatch her out the bed. Religious folk. She grabs whatever bit of blanket and towel she can to cover herself. And these religious folk snatch a half-naked woman out the bed and drag her through the streets of Jerusalem, take her to the house of God, throw her down in front of Jesus. She's been snatched out of a bed, humiliated through the streets of Jerusalem by religious folk who take her to the temple and now she finds out that the worst has yet to happen. Because when they throw her down, this is what they say. Jesus, the laws of Moses say that this woman ought to be stoned. And to her surprise, this group of religious folk have now picked up stones. And they're looking at Jesus, saying, we got him now. What you going to do, Jesus? Because you only have two options. You either have to violate the law of Moses, which proves you are not the Messiah, or you have to authorize us stoning her, which will cause the people not to love you anymore. We got him. And all we had to do was snatch a sister out of bed, humiliate her, and throw her down in front of the religious house, and we got Jesus where we want him. Lord, what you going to do now? The Bible says that Jesus exercises a third option. He begins writing on the ground. You must understand that this is, once again, his way of subtly disrespecting the Pharisees and scribes 
by suggesting that I am not going to deal with your foolishness. I am ignoring you because that's really all I have to do. Uh, but these Pharisees and their conservative Tea Party affiliates named the scribes won't let it go. You ever found some folk in life who just <laughs> won't let it go? Jesus, we know you hear us. What do you say? Violate the law? or stone her. Jesus keeps writing in the ground. They push it again. Hey! <laughs> you hear us. Stone her or violate the law. And Jesus says one of the most beloved and famous sentences in all of scripture. Well, he who is without sin, you throw the first stone. You know what Jesus is in essence saying to this crowd that wants this woman killed? Put that down. Yeah, well. That rock you're about to throw, put it down. Yeah. That judgment you're about to pass, yeah. put it down. All right. That name you're about to call her, put it down. Yeah. That condemnation you're about to execute, Jesus says, put it down. He says, put it down, first of all, watch this, because nobody in this circle is qualified to judge her. Yeah. And listen, I know y'all are Pharisees and scribes. I know you think you're holy. I know you memorize scripture. I know you know how to get to church. I know you know the religiosity of the day. But nobody in this crowd yeah. is qualified to judge. Look, look, th th there's no doubt about it. This woman is a sinner. She's caught in the act of sin. Nobody's trying to say that what she did is right. She's in sin. And the Pharisees and scribes bring her to Jesus. And here's what they say, Mary. They say, let's deal with the sin issue. We caught her in sin. We want you to convict her of her sin. We want you to condemn her of her sin. We want you to deal with the sin that we brought to you. And Jesus says, cool. But her sin ain't the only one that just walked in the room. Because when you brought her here and you brought her sin, you brought your sin with her. And therefore, this is what I'm going to say. Whoever is in this room that has never, ever, ever done anything wrong, never fallen short, never committed a sin, you have the right to be the first one. But if you know that you are a sinner, you have no authorization to condemn somebody else. You know what Jesus reminds him of is something that I believe some of us need to be reminded of because we apparently have taken it out of our Bible, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Watch, let me teach a little Bible. Let me tell you what happens. The law of adultery that they're referring to in Leviticus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 22, you gotta understand that, that it really, um, to understand the core of why the stoning had to occur, you have to understand that this is a patriarchal society. And the law of adultery was written to protect a husband's property, one of which was considered to be his wife. And so if another man sleeps with a husband's wife, he has violated the husband's property. And therefore, according to the law, watch this, both the woman and the man have to be stoned. So Jesus said, hold on, y'all brought the sister. But where's the brother? Come on. Here's the deep. So, in order for you to have your way, you want me to condemn a woman who broke the law, but you broke the law in bringing her here. Here's the irony, that, that while you're condemning someone of sin, you have committed sin in trying to condemn her of her sin. And so if she got to go down, you got to go down. 
Can I remind you that Isaiah says in chapter 64 and verse 6 that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God, which means that even when you think you're living at your religious best, your righteousness is still filthy in the eyes of God. When you're quoting scripture, when you're on your knees every day, when you're in worship every Sunday, I got news for you. You are still filthy rags in the eyes of God because none is righteous outside of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. What these Pharisees don't understand is what Jesus says to us in Matthew 7, and here it is in the Howard John Wesley version. How dare you judge somebody else's sin when you got your own stuff to deal with? Can I give you today's tweet? The the Bible is not meant to be a set of binoculars that help you look in the lives of others, but rather a mirror that causes you to look at your own self. Paul, stop, rewind, press play. The word of God does not authorize you to scope out and search out somebody else's issues and somebody else's sins and somebody else's faults. The word of God is meant to be a mirror that causes you to look at your own unfaithfulness, your own sinfulness, your own iniquity, your own unrighteousness, and deal with yourself. Jesus understands the problem with these Pharisees. It's a problem that exists in a lot of churches today is that Christianity is easy when your Christianity is comparative to somebody else. Righteousness is easy when your righteousness is relative to somebody else. Holiness is easy when you create a hierarchy of holiness that allows you to condemn somebody else's sin as greater than your own sin, so now you can sit back and pat yourself on the back and say, well, at least I'm not like them. So, so, watch what Jesus does. This is why I love Jesus. He writes on the ground. Now, Dustin, when you do your homework, you're going to find there's no scholar who can tell you what Jesus wrote. But what we do know is that whatever he does convicts those who have stones in their hand to walk away. So I can posit a possibility that Jesus started writing some other sins on the ground to remind them that Adultery ain't the only one that's in the room. And when I get to your sin, drop your stone, raise your hand, and walk out the door. Your sin may not be her sin, but trust me, yours is in the dirt somewhere. That's why he puts it in the dirt to remind us that all of us got some dirt that we got to deal with. Tell somebody, tell them, put it down. Put it down because you're not qualified to judge anybody. But but, but, but secondly, he says, put it down, and and God give me strength to preach this. I know this may offend some folk. He says, put it down because there are other issues you ought to be dealing with. Now, now Stains, let's get into Bible study this morning. The Bible says that Jesus comes to the temple. In verse number two, I believe John makes an error in his recording of Scripture. He says in verse number two that all the people came to see Jesus. Dean Clark, that's not right. Everybody's not there. Because the Pharisees and scribes aren't there. They're out doing something else. Now, now initially, I was going to preach that the problem with these folk is that Jesus was in the temple, and they weren't in the temple with Jesus, and you got to watch folk that aren't in the right place when the Lord is present. But, but then it dawned on me, Dean Johnson, that, you know, these are Pharisees and scribes. They, they work at the church all the time, and, you know, I ain't got to be at church every day. I mean, you know, I mean... 
I mean, I mean, come, come, come on, saints. You, there's no recorded instance that this is the Sabbath and they have to be there. So, I mean, I get it that you expect me to be here on the weekend, but I ain't, I ain't got to be at church every day. Do I mean I, that, 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 that doesn't prove I'm really, that doesn't prove I'm right with God. I, I ain't got to be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. For I ain't got to be at every meeting. Do I for y'all to believe that I'm right with the God? I, uh, amen from the pulpit. I, ain't, I don't have to be here every day. Sometimes you need to go home. So, so my issue, Brandon, is not that they are not in church. The issue is what they're doing when they're not in the temple. Because when they're not in the temple, they are trying to find a woman in the act of adultery. When they're not in the house of God, they're trying to find a woman in the act of adultery. It's 8 o'clock. Children aren't here. I can do it PG-13. They, they are looking for a woman in the act of adultery. Religious folk. And in order to catch a woman in the act of adultery, they literally have to peek in bedrooms. So they're outside the temple and ain't got nothing better to do than to peek in bedrooms. They're not trying to feed the hungry. They're peeking. They're not concerned about the widows and orphans. They're peeking. They're not addressing the oppression of the Roman Empire over the Jewish nation. They ain't got nothing better to do than peek in bedrooms. Now, I want you to understand why that's important. I need you to, to understand where this sermon came from this week. The sermon came to me on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I got a phone call from NBC Channel 4 wanting to interview me. They wanted to interview me because on Wednesday there was a controversial ruling by the Supreme Court that attacked the Defense of Marriage Act and allows gay couples who are legally married in a state that recognizes gay marriage to be eligible for federal benefits. And the interviewer called because he wanted to know how the black church felt about this issue. Right. Apparently somebody had shared with him that this is an issue of which I've made a public stand and I believe that I have a prophetic call to help the body of Christ navigate what is obviously a sensitive and hotbed issue. Yeah. Not to make a decision in one way or the other, but to help balance our understanding of biblical command and civil rights, to understand the balance between the church and the state, to be an advocate that says we can agree to disagree as long as we're talking and discussing and loving each other and respecting that we may never agree on this issue, but it doesn't mean that we have to be hateful or homophobic. So, I take it as my responsibility to be an advocate who says, let the church be the church, the state be the state, and God be the judge. So, they wanted to know what the black church felt about gay rights and gay marriage. My interview didn't make it.
because the Lord convicted me. And when they interviewed me, this is what I said. I said, it's interesting that you want to know what the church says on gay rights on Wednesday. But you didn't call me on Tuesday. Because on Tuesday, the same Supreme Court overturned Section 4 of the Voters' Rights Act, which allows blatant discriminatory practices in electoral procedures. And so now, in the South, there's legislation already being presented that it will be discriminatory against young black and brown voters to disenfranchise them from what our forefathers and foremothers died for. And the Supreme Court weren't talking about Congress ought to do something. This Congress? whose leadership can't even pass its own bills? This Congress who fights everything that a brown president puts out as an agenda for America, this president? The interviewer had the audacity to say, but race is not a factor anymore. You have the audacity to tell me race doesn't matter in the midst of the Trayvon Martin hearing? You have the audacity to tell me race doesn't matter when they're criticizing his friend as a witness because she's so nervous that her subjects and verbs don't match, so all of a sudden she's not telling the truth? You have the nerve to tell me race doesn't matter when a millionaire Polish chef has the audacity to say that surely I use the N-word. <laughs> what I wanted the interviewer to know is that this church has more to do than That my biggest issue is not who's loving who and who can be married. My issue is that brown and black boys are being incarcerated at six times the rate of any other racial subgroup. My concern is that HIV is spreading in our communities greater than any rate. My concern is that my right to vote is being challenged. And we got more to do than peak in bedrooms. Wow. This is church. Come on. Do, do, wow. do, do me a favor, no, somebody tell them, don't be a Pharisee. Because Pharisees ain't got nothing better to do than peek in bedrooms. While our right to vote is being challenged, peeking in bedrooms. While inner city violence in cities like Chicago are claiming black lives and the mayor is shutting down schools left and right and all we want to do is throw stones wow. for what's going on in bedrooms. Put that down. Because nobody's qualified to judge. Put it down because we've got other issues to deal with. And then Jesus says, finally put it down because stoning her is not on my agenda. Here is a sister caught in sin. There's no doubt about it. The question this passage raises that's critical for the body of Christ is what is our responsibility to those who are caught in sin? 
We don't talk about that a lot, but, but what are we obligated to do for those who have fallen in their walk with the Lord? What should you do when you know that there's a brother or sister who's not living up to the will of God? What is God's assignment on your life? You search scripture. You are never called to judge. You are never called to condemn. You're never called to expose. Here's what the Bible says. I want you to read it when you get home. I promise you it's right there in Galatians 6. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness. Write those words down. Spiritual, restore, and gentleness. Which means that half the folk in church have no business dealing with anybody who's fallen in sin. Because the Bible says in order to deal with it, number one, you got to be spiritual. So that just disqualified half your pew. You have to seek to restore. And you have to do it with gentleness. Anything else disqualifies you from dealing with it. So let me tell you why the Pharisees have no business dealing with this woman's sin. Because remember, they catch her in the act of adultery. JT, to catch her in the act of adultery, they have to know who she is. They have to know who she with. They have to know where it's going down. And they have to know when it's going to happen. Now, now how you know all of that? You, you ain't just find that out. You've known this for a while, but you've never done anything to help her. They did not care about this woman until she served their purpose. Their motive was not to restore her, but to embarrass her. I don't need folk around me who see me slipping and don't intervene and don't intercede and don't pray and don't try to help me. Now, the one thing the Pharisees did do that was right, they brought her to Jesus. Boy, let me tell you that that, that, that really is where your assignment ends. You bring them to Jesus. I tell you, great things happen when you lay people at the feet of Jesus. Great things happen when you pray and cast people into the care of Jesus. Great things happen when you trust the Lord in prayer to deal with a brother or a sister who has fallen short of the will of God. When you pray, great things happen. But here's where they went wrong. Now I'm almost done. They bring her to Jesus. They're in the temple. They're Pharisees. They're religious folk in the temple with Jesus, and the deepest desire in their heart for her was that she be stoned. See the scenario. Religious folk in the house of God, in the presence of the master, and within their heart, their deepest desire for their sister is that she be stoned. What's wrong with this picture. People who say they love the Lord and worship in the house of God and have a heart filled with malice and wrath. So Jesus says to them, put that down because when you bring her to me, my agenda for her life is not to stone her. Because God did not send me into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So here's the question, Pharisees and scribes. What do you think God's agenda for a sinner is? It's too deep, too deep. Where does God get greater glory? In a sinner who is stoned, 
or a sinner who is saved. Jesus said to him, look, if you're bringing her to me, you need to know that my agenda is not to judge her, but to justify her. Not to condemn her, but to convert her. Uh, not to harm her, but to help her. Anybody can throw stones. Anybody can judge. Anybody can condemn. But only a gracious Lord and a merciful master can look beyond faults and change a life. So, saints, I come out and tell you that, 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 that I was wrong in the introduction to this sermon. Because I told you John 8 was not a miracle. Yes, it was. Greater than walking on water, greater than turning water into wine, is the miracle of salvation. Where sinners are saved. Where those who are wrong are made right. Where those who are caught in the act walk out in righteousness. That is the greatest miracle of God. That God is able to take sinners like you and like me and able to turn our lives around and give up unrighteousness and walk away from iniquity and move in the words of Jesus to go and sin no more. So the Lord tells them to drop their stones. They walk away. And when Jesus looks up, it's just him and her. Because that's where salvation begins. Not in a condemning crowd, but in those private moments with the Lord. Nothing will change your life more than a private moment with Jesus. He says to her, listen, I, I said to them that the only person who could throw a stone was one who had not sinned. Which meant that in that whole room, there was only one person who could throw a stone, Jesus. And he says, I don't condemn you. If the Lord doesn't, what makes you think you can? Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, now I, I do my homework before I come, and a lot of scholars wonder, did she do it again? You know, because that's, that, that's our, our question. Here it is, because in the body of Christ, one of the most damaging spirits are those who question the authenticity of somebody's repentance. Come on, pastor, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, this ain't children's church. And so we see people who are repentant, sorrowful, and we doubt it because we wonder, are they going to do it again? You never see this woman again in scripture. We don't know. And there's a reason why. Because what the Lord is saying is it's none of your business. I, I know, I know you. You, you, you can't, you can't, you can't clap because you got a sanctified private investigator badge. But the emphasis is stop following her. Stop trying to figure out what she's doing. Stop trailing her and start dealing with you and getting your walk right with God. And your life right before the Lord. Somebody say, put that down. 